going to cover 10 topics ending with some mnemonics to help you remember some of the things that we've talked about during this lecture. Again, for people who are preparing for an exam or taking an examination, there are a few things to help remember in the overview of orthopedic pathology. There are a few things in the stem of a question that can help you uh, immediately, and there are some helpful things to review in the answers. When we're looking at bone lesions, it's most helpful to remember bone lesions by age, and it's easiest to remember them in patients less than 30 or greater than 30. When you review textbooks and they're giving you definitive ages, uh, it's hard to remember those ages and they aren't as important as remembering big classifications. So patients less than 30 may be affected by Ewing sarcoma, osteosarcoma, osteoblastoma, osteoblastoma, or chondroblastoma. Whereas the older population, patients greater than 30 and certainly greater than 50 are affected by chondrosarcomas, metastases, lymphomas, myelomas, chordomas, giant cell tumor, and Paget's disease of bone. Pain is important in the patient presentation because it may or may not be associated with trauma. Pathologic fractures occur in abnormal bone. Therefore, it's helpful to remember that patients that do not have associated trauma, patients that fall from a standing height or are stepping off of a curb or have very minimal trauma may have an associated benign or malignant tumor. Now, osteodosteoma is a great test question to remember because the pain that's associated with osteodosteoma is very specific. It occurs diurnal, so two in the afternoon, two in the morning, and it is very uh, commonly relieved with anti-inflammatories such as an aspirin or NSAIDs. It is not relieved by Tylenol and actually not necessarily relieved with other pain medications. On the contrary, soft tissue sarcomas are deceptively painless. So these are lesions that patients will present with that have grown to a very large size and often the practitioner uh, mistakenly diagnoses them as benign because they aren't painful. Here's an example of an osteodosteoma. Uh, the patients have an eccentric bone forming lesion with a central target and this should be an easy question for you to remember uh, for patients young patient diaphyseal bone lesion diurnal night uh, and day pain symptoms that is relieved by aspirin or anti-inflammatories this table shows you most treatment regimens for sarcomas and other benign entities Chemotherapy and surgery is most commonly used for Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma. Radiation and surgery is most commonly used for soft tissue sarcomas. The use of chemotherapy remains current controversial in the current state of um, treatment in the United States, at least, is radiation and surgery as standard of care. Chondrosarcomas are treated with limb salvage surgery or wide excision, which refers to the same thing basically surgical management, and the point here is they don't get radiation therapy, and they don't get chemotherapy, but they get a good negative margin surgical resection. Metastatic disease, lymphoma, and myeloma, which often can be categorized together, would be treated with open reduction and internal fixation, typically with radiation therapy, but consideration of radiation therapy given. And then giant cell tumor, osteoblastoma, chondroblastoma, will be treated with intralesional resection, how you reconstruct these is less important than understanding that they do not undergo observation or radical excision. And then again, osteodosteoma here is a bit of an outlier. Uh, the standard of care for treatment of an osteodosteoma is radiofrequency ablation, unless there's an unusual situation where it's close to the spine or close to a neurovascular bundle or a structure that may be damaged. And I'll remind you that before you ever treat a patient, especially on your examination, you need to make sure that you have a diagnosis and know what you're treating. Often on the exams, if a biopsy is offered as an answer, it is most likely the answer you should choose. Sometimes the terminology used for surgical excision can be confusing, and so I, I like to show this slide to explain this. There are four considerations for surgical in, in excision of tumors. The first is incisional or within the lesion. And this is most commonly referred to for a benign lesion such as a giant cell tumor, chondroblastoma, or a lesion when you actually enter into the lesion, remove the lesion, and then perform some sort of uh, procedure to extend that lesion beyond what it started as. The second consideration is a marginal excision or just at the margin of the tumor. 
this is when we talk about removing fatty masses, such as a lipoma or an atypical lipoma, when the tumor does not invade the surrounding structures whatsoever, and it doesn't increase your um, tumor resection or doesn't improve local recurrence to destroy surrounding tissues by removing normal tissue. That does need to occur with the next type of surgical excision, which is a wide excision. Now we talk about this interchangeably with limb salvage. So limb salvage surgery or wide excision would take a normal cuff of tissue. So if you're removing a soft tissue sarcoma, where this term is most commonly used, you would want to remove a small cuff of normal tissue, such as muscle or fascia or even bone sometimes, in order to ensure that you have a safety zone or a safety net between the tumor and normal tissue. A radical excision removes the entire compartment. When this used to be discussed, it was considered to remove the entire quadriceps muscle, for example. So you would take out the vastus medialis, intermedius, lateralis, and uh, remove the entire compartment top to bottom. The consideration today is typically an amputation uh, when this may occur. And this is, uh, again, most commonly referred to for consideration of uh, soft tissue sarcomas. As we move into diagnosing and treating bone tumors, there are four big questions that help in the first part, and that is diagnosing a bone tumor. These questions uh, came from Dr. Enneking, and they include location, what is the tumor doing to the bone, and what is the bone doing to the tumor, and then what's the matrix of the lesion. And oftentimes, if you see an x-ray and you start asking yourself these four questions, you can narrow things down uh, significantly to end up with the diagnosis at hand. Now here's an example of those four questions. Overall, the first thing uh, that should draw your eye here is that this is a skeletally immature patient. So for what we've discussed thus far, this would be a patient under 30 years old, which may narrow your dif differential diagnosis immediately. Then we ask ourselves the question, what is the location? Well, this lesion appears to be a metaphyseal occurring lesion. What's the tumor doing to the bone? The tumor is creating a huge soft tissue mass. It has expanded beyond the bone and is extremely aggressive. It's moving so quickly that when we look at what is the bone doing to the tumor, there is very little to no response. The cortex here is almost intact. You can see a small area where the bone has been eroded, but the tumor is moving so quickly that it is expanding beyond the bone. When we ask ourselves the fourth question, what is the matrix? Well, you can see here from the green arrow that the matrix being formed is bone. So a patient under 30, skeletally immature patient, metaphyseal location, very aggressive, expansive uh, bone lesion with very little reaction from the bone itself and a bone matrix, uh, diagnosis osteosarcoma. So here we are, osteosarcoma. Patients are typically under 30. Osteosarcomas are the most common primary bone sarcoma that exists. There are multiple types with variable prognoses, but the one we most commonly see is a conventional intramedullary osteosarcoma. The majority of these occur around the knee. Secondarily, they occur around the proximal humerus. And the image here goes through the same four questions to get to the same diagnosis. This is a skeletally immature patient, so the patient is less than 30. It is a metaphyseal bone lesion, that's the location. What's the tumor doing to the bone and what's the bone doing to the tumor? We can see that the uh, arrow is on the tumor, which is expanding significantly beyond the bone. The bone is trying to respond with a periosteal reaction and, and trying to make a, uh, uh, some sort of healing response, but the tumor is moving too quickly. And then the most important thing here is the matrix. And when we look, the bone looks more dense and sclerotic in the metaphysis than it does in the epiphysis or in the tibia, if you use that for comparison. This is a bone forming matrix. So again, a young patient under 30, skeletally immature, metaphyseal lesion, very aggressive in, in appearance. And the lesion is, is matrix has osseous characteristics. So this is an osteosarcoma. Osteosarcomas majority occur centrally, so that conventional intramedullary osteosarcoma we see, but a smaller uh, percentage of them can be surface lesions. These are the surface uh, lesions on the right and a conventional osteosarcoma on the left. Again, the majority of time you're going to see a, a conventional type osteosarcoma, such as on the left. The lesion originates in the bone, and as the soft tissue mass expands, it begins forming that osseous type matrix 
but the bone itself, uh, the intramedullary canal, is involved first, and the soft tissue mass is secondary. The lesion in the middle is a parosteal osteosarcoma, and we refer to this as a lesion that is stuck on bone. The, it, the matrix appears as if it were just stuck like a piece of chewing gum onto the bone. And then to the far right is a periosteal osteosarcoma. And I remember the difference between the two as parosteal truly is stuck on the surface and does not extend uh, down beyond the periosteum typically. But a periosteal osteosarcoma arises essentially from the periosteum. So it's a layer deeper, it's a much more aggressive tumor, and has a different prognosis. This is often uh, termed having a sunburst appearance because the tumor begins at the surface of the bone and then basically uh, like a, a, the reflection of the sun off of water off the horizon uh, has this uh, uh, sunburst type appearance. So when we ask the four questions again uh, and we use this x-ray as an example the location is metaphyseal for an osteosarcoma the tumor has a very aggressive soft tissue mass. So what is the tumor bone bone tumor interaction? Well, the tumor is moving far uh, more aggressively than the bone itself can even pick up. And here's an example of that big soft tissue mass extending itself out of the bone. You can see that the bone is trying to respond with a Codman's triangle. So a Codman's triangle uh, essentially is when the periosteum is lifted and it creates that a triangular shape. But the bone uh, below it uh, cannot respond quickly enough, so you end up with what appears as a triangle. The uh, tumor itself here is also forming what we call hair on end or a hair on end pattern. But you can see the matrix underlying uh, throughout this is an osseous matrix. And again, this is a skeletally immature patient, very important. So patients under 30, skeletally immature, that have um, a very aggressive bone forming lesion with very little reaction and an osseous matrix, osteosarcoma. Here's another example. This is a skeletally immature patient. So we're thinking about a patient under 30. The lesion is metaphyseal. When we look at the uh, tumor bone, bone tumor interaction then, it doesn't look as if there is much occurring. Uh, the bone appears to be in pretty good shape and you don't see any sort of soft tissue mass beyond it. But when we look at the matrix, the arrow is showing you that there is a bone matrix underlying. Now it's helpful and although Inneking's four questions are based on a plain x-ray, we now have the ability to use an MRI scan. And when you get the MRI scan, uh, this is helpful because it shows you in the upper right, the red arrow is now showing you a soft tissue mass. So when we talk about that tumor bone, bone tumor interaction, the tumor here is so aggressive that on plain x-ray the bone appears completely normal. But as we move through the MRI scan, we see that there is a significantly larger underlying lesion seen on the MRI scan than we saw on the plain x-ray, which would let you know when we talk about that tumor bone, bone tumor interaction, it is a serious aggressive tumor uh, response, but the bone itself hasn't had time to respond. That tells you how rapid and aggressive this tumor is. The soft tissue mass is significant medially, and usually these are seen on clinical exam and noticed by families in addition to pain uh, that the patient would present with. So when we biopsy this uh, lesion and we look at this bone forming matrix, what do we see? Well, osteoid is uh, immature bone, and typically, as seen here, it has malignant rimming osteoblasts. Now on parts of this, uh, a slide, when you biopsy these, you will not only see the malignant rimming osteoblast in the immature bone, but you will see mature lamellar bone. And this is a great slide to show you the contrast below the mature lamellar bone with lamellar lines, all of the uh, cells that have formed and matured over time, a very thoughtful process. When you look at what should be marrow and fat then around the, the mature lamellar bone, what you see is a sea of malignant cells. And then again, osteoid should not be present in a bone unless a patient is fractured or is undergoing fracture repair. And the fact that these malignant appearing uh, dark blue cells are present throughout the marrow is a clue that this is an osteosarcoma. So an important thing for an osteosarcoma, as we've discussed, is obtaining the diagnosis and that you biopsy before you treat these. It's important to note the type of osteosarcoma, what you're dealing with in order to treat a patient appropriately. It's also helpful 
to obtain chest imaging for these patients because we want to know the stage. Sarcomas have a hematogenous route of spread and have a tendency to spread to the chest before any sort of lymph node spread. And that's different from other types of carcinomas uh, and separates sarcomas from carcinomas. The treatment for an osteosarcoma, chemotherapy, surgery, chemotherapy. The standard of care uh, for surgical treatment is wide excision or limb salvage surgery. And remember, those mean the same thing. The uh, important thing to remember is that the majority of patients who have an osteosarcoma can successfully be treated while preserving their limb. But osteosarcomas, like Ewing sarcomas, get treated with chemotherapy and surgery. Chondrosarcoma is a malignant cartilage tumor. So when we talk about the matrix, we're talking about a cartilage matrix as opposed to a bone matrix. Now remember, in, in contrast to an osteosarcoma, chondrosarcomas occur in patients greater than 30 years of age. Many of them develop in a previously normal bone. So uh, these are patients who just spontaneously develop a chondrosarcoma. But if you recall, there uh, are many, many enchondromas that exist, and about a third of chondrosarcomas may develop out of a pre-existing lesion, such as an enchondroma or an osteochondroma. Now the concern for patients with multiple hereditary exostoses or multiple osteochondromas is more significant than a patient who has a single uh, osteochondroma. As we look at our four questions again to, to diagnose a chondrosarcoma, the location of these is typically metaphyseal. The tumor itself is slowly expanding, so cartilage grows very slowly, and as it pushes against the bone, the bone has a chance to slowly expand and uh, push itself out, and the bone is usually misshapen in the setting of a chondrosarcoma. The bone has endosteal scalloping, we talk about. We use the terms endosteal scalloping and erosion because the tumor, uh, to, to a certain point, will expand and grow through the bone, and then it has these sort of scalloped appearing areas, these sort of half moon uh, areas that have pushed out in the bone. And then the matrix is cartilage, so the punctate uh, arcs and rings of cartilage are typically seen in the middle of these lesions. Now, an important factor here for these primary bone tumors is that this chondrosarcoma occurs in a patient skeletally mature, typically a patient over 30 years of age. Chondrosarcomas can arise in osteochondromas, as stated, and here's an example of that. We talk about uh, the cartilage cap in these lesions. When you look at this plain x-ray, uh, this patient clearly has had a, a bone uh, issue for some time, probably since birth, because this is a patient who had multiple hereditary exostoses, so the entire metaphysis is uh, misshapen. And when you look at the uh, image to the right uh, and you see the surface of this osteochondroma, typically osteochondromas are mature. When the patient stops growing, the osteochondroma stops growing, and the surface becomes uh, very mature. But the arrow is showing you a very disrupted surface to this lesion. When you look at the uh, MRI scan of this same uh, patient, the arrow is on the cartilaginous cap of this lesion. Now, we talk about cartilage caps being greater than 2 centimeters or less than 2 centimeters, but this is truly the definition of a malignant cartilage cap. You can see uh, on the MRI scan to the left, the lesion is uh, consistent with muscle on uh, imaging, but when we move to uh, the right um, and change uh, imaging, the, the lesion is quite different than muscle. And you can see the lobular pattern that is characteristic. It looks like a big uh, stalk of cauliflower uh, consistent with the chondrosarcoma. Here's a lesion on uh, coronal and sagittal imaging, and you see the same thing. It almost looks like someone took a big stalk of cauliflower uh, and punched it on the leg. Now, this is not a parosteal uh, osteosarcoma because the lesion uh, is dark on T1, bright on T2 imaging, and it's very different than bone. A parosteal osteosarcoma would look like a dense uh, uh, structure of bone. So, chondrosarcomas have a particular location, and um, as opposed to talking about metaphyseal, epiphyseal, diaphyseal, that they really like to occur in the proximal and distal femur, the proximal humerus, and have a predilection for flat bones. So we see them in the scapula and pelvis quite commonly. When we do see them in the long bones, uh, you see this pattern I was talking about where there has been a slow progression of the tumor pushing against the bone and irritating the bone, and there's a significant reaction from the bone. You can see here the 
uh, cortices are twice as thick as they normally would be if you look at the, the normal bone at the bottom of the slide. You can see the matrix uh, centrally in the bone then where you have the, the scalloped areas, these lytic areas, and then the areas of uh, arctate punks and rings. And there's even a soft tissue mass extending to the lateral aspect of the bone. Here's an MRI scan that shows you a chondrosarcoma. And the uh, image to the left is a T1 weighted image. The image to the right is T2. And uh, sarcomas have a characteristic that they have very sharp borders on MRI scan. They have a very sharp start and stop within the bone, which you can see here on the left and the right. The bone is expanded, but you can see exactly where it begins and ends within the bone. When you uh, enhance the image on T2 sequences, you see how bright the lesion is. There's a lot of water in cartilage, and that's very characteristic for chondrosarcomas. The tumor bone, bone tumor interaction, uh, again, the endosteal scalloping, cortical expansion, cortical erosion, and here is that central uh, lesion, the arcs and rings, the punctate calcifications that we talk about that are quite characteristic for uh, cartilage tumors and chondrosarcomas. And this is a humerus. So as we talked again, that the chondrosarcoma slowly expands the bone, uh, pushes the bone out to make it abnormal in shape. This is a very abnormally shaped bone. You can see the endosteal scalloping and erosion here. And then that oddly shaped bone. On MRI scan, chondrosarcomas look like bunches of cauliflower again. And as you can see, it has this lobular appearance uh, uh, all the way around. When you are trying to differentiate between an enchondroma and a chondrosarcoma, and often we say if you're really trying to look at the difference in a bone or bone architecture, if you can cover up the lesion itself and then look at the surrounding bone to determine if it looks like a normal bone. Sometimes that can be helpful. Two big differences between an enchondroma and a chondrosarcoma. Number one, an enchondroma doesn't have pain associated with it. The patient to the left here who presents to you uh, with shoulder pain likely has AC joint arthritis, may have rotator cuff pathology. But the lesion itself is highly unlikely to be causing pain or problem. The lesion to the right uh, has uh, diaphyseal bone changes. Uh, there is endosteal scalloping and erosion, and this patient is going to present to you with pain. On imaging, if you cover up the lesion on the left, the bone itself looks completely normal, which also helps you to determine that it's unlikely that the lesion is causing a problem with the bone. To the right, if you cover up the lesion that we see on plain imaging, the bone around it is still abnormal. There's expansion, the cortex has changes and lytic changes throughout it. So this is also a helpful way to say uh, that whether a lesion is actually changing the bone around it. When you biopsy these lesions, chondrosarcomas have a characteristic appearance. The histology shows a chondroid matrix. Cartilage itself should not be very cellular. As uh, cartilage tumors increase in grade, the cellularity increases significantly. The number of mitoses and cytologic atypia determines this. And uh, cartilage tumors have these typical binucleate cells. So you see one cell with two nuclei in it. Often they are uh, pushed together. Um, and this is a characteristic finding uh, in appearance of cartilage. We often talk about cartilage being uh, blue in appearance. You can see this sort of has a purple uh, matrix to it on this particular slide. We talk about blue balls. So cartilage has these lobular uh, areas. It looks like lobular cauliflower and it almost forms into little balls. The histology then is blue uh, in appearance. And this is just showing you cell after cell after cell that has a binucleate uh, nucleus within it. This is the reason, uh, and I love this slide because it shows you why uh, the cartilage tumors allow the bone to expand and why there is such a slow bone tumor, tumor bone interaction between the two. The blue on this slide, the light purple or the bluish color has replaced the marrow. If you look at the far right, you see the white space that has the fatty containing uh, marrow elements. And then to the left, you have the purple cartilage moving through. Now, the light pink uh, areas are bone.
an osteosarcoma, a Ewing sarcoma, any other lesion would completely destroy that pink lamellar bone matrix. But the cartilage has moved itself through, it's filled the spaces, it's actually left the bone intact. And as it moves itself through, the bone is irritated, it changes, it grows, it expands, it tries to get out of the way. And this histology slide is a great example as to why cartilage tumors actually change the bone and the bone architecture over time, as opposed to other highly aggressive malignant bone tumors like metastatic disease, Ewing sarcoma, uh, osteosarcoma, they completely destroy the bone. Cotter sarcomas, like other sarcomas, require systemic staging as part of their evaluation, whether it's a chest x-ray or a CT scan. And then we talked about the treatment being different for these lesions. They don't undergo chemotherapy or radiation treatment. The treatment is wide excision. So Ewing sarcoma, uh, we've talked about osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, and now Ewing sarcoma. Again, this is a, a, an under 30 disease most commonly. It's not exclusive, but most common. These patients present with a large soft tissue mass. They present with fever and weight loss and an elevated ESR and CRP, so they are very frequently confused with infection. When you're looking at the imaging, they have a, this big soft tissue mass. They very commonly occur in flat bones like the scapula and pelvis. So pelvis lesions can be confused uh, um, for infection when indeed it's a Ewing sarcoma. We often talk about in the evaluation of these lesions, uh, when it's uh, a big soft tissue mass and a bone lesion, is it a primary soft tissue mass or a primary bone lesion in here? The yellow arrow is showing you the bone. We're also seeing the big soft tissue mass. And one rule we like to follow is if you actually put your finger in the middle of the lesion, or here we'll put a star there, it's most likely to tell you where the lesion started in here. Uh, this would tell you that this is a bone lesion with secondary soft tissue extension. There's some characteristic terminology used in describing uh, Ewing sarcoma radiographically. It is a permeative, aggressive appearing lesion. But we also talk about onion skinning or a sunburst type periosteal reaction. And, and the black arrow is on this onion skinning that we will see. This is truly referring to that of an onion skin. The multiple layers have developed one on top of the other uh, around the lesion. And this occurs because the uh, small round blue cells of the Ewing sarcoma begin to push themselves out of the bone and put pressure against the periosteum. Now, in the young patient under 30, they have a very robust periosteum that uh, attempts healing. As the periosteum heals, the tumor grows beyond this, and, and then the periosteum heals, and it forms a layer upon layer of very thin uh, bone formation creating this onion skin or sunburst appearance. Now as the tumor pushes itself outside of the bone you begin to see a very large soft tissue mass uh, push itself outside of the bone which is classic for a uh, Ewing sarcoma. The other small round blue cell tumor that can do this is a lymphoma but if we think about these age categories a patient younger than 30 with a big uh, soft tissue mass outside of the bone most likely should be a Ewing sarcoma. That same patient who's over 30 uh, and even over 50, most likely has a lymphoma. Here's an example on the uh, MRI scan, uh, the lesion on the left. I told you before, these sarcomas have a very sharp definitive line, and you can see in the metaphyseal part of the bone here, there's a very sharp line. The lesion to the right shows you some uh, very small uh, uh, layers of periosteum forming that onion skinning, and then a big soft tissue mass. Now, relative to the amount of bone destruction, we see very little bone destruction and a very large soft tissue mass characteristic for Ewing sarcoma. So here's a Ewing sarcoma in the scapula. So uh, Ewing sarcoma likes to occur in the uh, diaphyseal long bones or in the flat bones like the pelvis or the scapula. The tumor bone bone tumor interaction, the tumor is, is very aggressive, it's creating a very large soft tissue mass, and in contrast, the bone may have some of the reactions I told you about, a Codman's triangle, onion skinning, uh, but there often is a very big soft tissue mass seen on MRI scan in relation to very little bone destruction. The bone itself then uh, doesn't have much in response, and the matrix is a small round blue cell tumor. So when we're looking, we don't see bone, we don't see cartilage, uh, we, the small round blue cell tumors are not uh, radio dense, and then this most commonly occurs in a skeletally immature patient. Here are the uh, plain x-rays, the AP lateral. You may see this, what appears to be surface uh, uh, irritation. It's not significantly revealing, but this is a patient who presents in significant pain, may have physical findings of a large soft tissue mass. 
So here on the MRI scan, we see the huge soft tissue mass associated with this lesion. Again, the plain x-rays don't show that as much is going on as you can see on the MRI scan. There's some periosteal reaction, there's some involvement. This is very characteristic of a small round blue cell tumor. Not a lot of destruction on the x-ray and then a huge soft tissue mass as seen by the red arrows. The yellow arrow is on the bone. And if we follow our principle to put our finger in the middle of the tumor, it's most likely to fall onto bone. When soft tissue masses uh, occur primarily and erode into a bone, they don't occur on either side of the bone, especially a flat bone. And there's a lot of erosion and a lot of uh, destruction of the bone if that were to occur. So a lesion that has uh, very little bone destruction, very little bone reaction with a huge soft tissue mass in a skeletally immature patient is a characteristic of a Ewing sarcoma. The histology then confirms this. So we've looked at the plate x-rays, we've done a detailed three-dimensional imaging, and the Ewing uh, sarcoma histology is quite characteristic for small round blue cell tumor with pseudo rosettes as seen here. It's CD99 positive on immunohistochemical staining. There is a reciprocal 1122 uh, translocation, and now there is even a, um, an immunohistochemical stain for the EWS fly1 gene. So we're able to make this uh, uh, determination a lot faster in these patients instead of having to wait on the uh, molecular testing, we can do uh, EWS fly1 staining to make the diagnosis. Well, in these patients, I told you, they can present looking exactly like an infection. The patients have a large soft tissue mass, which may look like pus. They have uh, an elevated uh, set rate C-reactive protein. They may have a fever. So we follow the principles of culture, which you biopsy, biopsy, which you culture. And when you look at this uh, pathology side by side, this is an infection. You can see uh, variable cells of different sizes uh, and characteristics. There's a large uh, uh, cell just to the uh, right of center here that is phagocytizing many smaller cells. You see uh, polymorphonuclear cells, lymphocytes, histiocytes, and other cells. And that's as opposed to a Ewing sarcoma that actually has a very characteristic uniform appearance of a small round blue cell tumor after small round blue cell tumor. So the cell after cell after cell looks the same. These cells are uh, recapitulating and growing uh, themselves over and over again and uh, it has a very different appearance than infection so that biopsy is all important in determining a Ewing sarcoma versus an infection. The treatment of Ewing sarcoma, uh, just like osteosarcoma, uh, neoadjuvant or preoperative chemotherapy, surgical treatment most commonly 95% of the time with wide excision or some sort of local control, and then chemotherapy. Now there's some question that uh, comes up and in the past it has been considered appropriate that Ewing sarcoma would be treated with uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiation therapy. Uh, but the standard of care, especially for the extremities, is chemotherapy, surgery, chemotherapy. Then patients with large pelvic disease burden, patients with metastatic disease, or patients with some uh, difficult uh, spine lesions, we do combine chemotherapy with radiation therapy, but that is more of an exception these days than the norm. Metastatic bone disease very common uh, to see in practice and very common to treat by the general practitioner, so it shows up on exams a lot. A patient greater than 50 years old with a lytic bone lesion has metastatic disease until proven otherwise. You have an even higher suspicion in a patient with a prior cancer history. Patients can go 20 years uh, in between their primary cancer diagnosis and the presentation of metastatic disease. So uh, just because a patient has been disease free for years, uh, I've seen it happen at the 20 year uh, disease free considered interval. These patients should be considered for metastatic disease. Here's a patient who has a, a pathologic fracture, a subtrochanteric femur, and the arrow is showing you the lytic destructive bone lesion. It has fading edges. It does not have a sharp circumscribed border and uh, the lesion is clearly lytic. In considering metastatic disease, there are five big uh, primary lesions that are osteophiles, prostate, thyroid, breast, lung, kidney. I remember this as PT Barnum likes kids. Some people like to remember a BLT with a kosher pickle. However you like to remember it is fine. Just be sure that you remember that these are the five big uh, lesions that like to travel to the bone. That's important because when you're evaluating a patient with uh, suspected metastatic bone disease, these are the four things you need to do. CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And because the prostate, thyroid, breast, lung, kidney fall within the scope of a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis, the majority of the time you will find these primary lesions. There are uh, uh, 
caveats to this, of course, squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue uh, or an adenocarcinoma unknown primary may not be found here, but the majority of the time, this is successful. A whole body bone scan is helpful in, in uh, staging. So if you're trying to make a diagnosis, you want to CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis because it's going to find the primary lesion. In staging, you need to look uh, all over the body for any other metastatic disease, and a whole body bone scan helps for that. There are some disease-specific tests which may or may not be helpful, and then, of course, the biopsy. Now, a patient who's presenting to you for the first time with metastatic bone disease and needs to have a biopsy, a patient who has a two-year disease-free interval who presents with a new bone lesion needs to have a new bone biopsy performed. Patients can present with more than one primary tumor. Uh, and so these patients may have more than one metastatic disease. And I've uh, seen a patient present with three uh, tumors in the same setting, and they had uh, three different levels of metastatic disease. So biopsy is critical. The uh, disease-specific test to be considered for prostate PSA, for thyroid, an ultrasound of the thyroid may lead you to well, whether this is a benign entity or malignant. A mammogram can help with breast disease for lung, CT chest, or chest x-ray. CT chest of the abdomen uh, should show you a kidney lesion. Myeloma is tricky because a bone scan uh, doesn't help. The lesions are often cold. So a myeloma uh, is best evaluated by SPEP-UPEP, which can make the diagnosis. A skeletal survey will tell you the extent of disease, and that's a, a plain x-ray shot in the AP plane of the entire skeleton. Lymphoma, CT chest, abdomen, pelvis may find uh, significant levels of lymphadenopathy to help you make that diagnosis. So again, CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, whole body bone scan, your disease specific test, it may or may not be helpful, and then a biopsy. A biopsy is critical in making your diagnosis. And if you don't have a biopsy for a patient, uh, you don't need to treat the patient. Only treat a patient that you have a clear, definitive uh, diagnosis for. When you do the biopsy, metastatic bone disease is seen on histology as nests and glands. Now, uh, the upper uh, right of this picture has a, a mature lamellar bone, and the lower left has uh, a nest and a big uh, central glandular area. Th these two things should never be seen together. So mature bone, uh, immature bone, and glands do not go together. The pathology doctors have to do very uh, detailed immunohistochemical stains and evaluation to try to uh, get a diagnosis to what the origin of this carcinoma may be. But the best uh, you may be able to do is to determine this is a carcinoma and not a sarcoma and not a lymphoma. The yellow arrow is showing you the uh, glands and the abutment of the normal lamellar bone. So how do we treat metastatic bone disease? Well, surgery, radiation, and systemic therapy are the mainstay. When we're treating these uh, lesions with surgery, we have uh, a higher consideration of surgery for lower extremity lesions with any cortical destruction and, and are painful. Th these are likely patients that are going to go to surgery. When you're treating these patients, you really need to consider a, a, a more aggressive um, treatment strategy than you would for a regular fracture. The, the bone here is, is undergoing destruction due to cancer cells, and there's a whole vicious cycle going on uh, down deep. So you need to treat these differently. We fix the whole bone. We use polymethyl methacrylate. And one very important caveat is that the entire bone that is uh, um, invaded needs to be treated. When you're uh, dragging cancer up and down the bone, putting in a nail, the entire bone has to be treated. Well, if you're unsure as to whether a lesion needs to be treated or not, uh, using uh, prediction ca classifications may be helpful. It's ideal that a patient be treated with an intact bone. Uh, they get out of the hospital faster, they recover faster, they, they bear weight faster. So we'd like to predict who are uh, who may not be at risk for pathologic fracture and treat them sooner and earlier. One classification system very helpful for this is uh, the Morels classification or scoring system. And what this does is look at se several variables in a score. So the site, how much pain the patient has, whether the lesion is lytic or plastic, and then the size of cortex involved get garners a score. So a peritrochanteric lesion that has functional pain, which will be weight-bearing pain, uh, that is lytic in nature, that is large, greater than two-thirds the size of the bone, would already have a, a score of 12. 
Well, uh, the numbers are important. Less than seven, uh, the patient may be treated non-operatively. Eight, consider stabilization, and nine and above, prophylactic stabilization. Now, these numbers are pretty tight, and it's hard to uh, uh, say that a definitive seven doesn't get surgery and an eight does. It's important to consider the overall biology. What kind of tumor are we dealing with? What is the patient's age and functional status? And what disease uh, state are they in? Are they new, newly diagnosed with widely metastatic disease? Or are they newly diagnosed with a single metastatic bone lesion? And your medical oncologist may be able to help you work through this. Uh, and if you're unsure from them, certainly consult uh, an orthopedic oncologist. Here's an example. 57-year-old woman with lung metastases to the femoral neck, and if we consider the location, peritrochanteric, the pain is functional, so she tells you she has weight-bearing pain, uh, pain when turning over in bed, uh, and is pretty miserable, comes into clinic in a wheelchair. The lesion is lytic, and if you look at the uh, lateral uh, femoral neck x-ray, at least half the bone is destroyed. So when we add these up, this patient has an 11, which puts us over the uh, 9 and above scale, so this is a patient who definitely needs this patient went on to have a uh, long cemented ME arthroplasty. So what about radiation therapy and radiation treatment as an adjunct? Well, you can consider no radiation if a patient has radical resection of a bone uh, or bone lesion. Uh, likely there's no disease left behind and, and the patient won't need radiation therapy. This is pretty rare uh, to occur and unlikely that a general orthopedist would be doing this. Now, the patient who uh, has micro or macro disease uh, who was treated with a nail or a plate likely needs radiation therapy. Now the course they get is shorter and smaller than for a sarcoma, about 35 gray as opposed to 50 or 60 gray. But the consideration needs to be given and you need to talk to the radiation oncology team that they radiate the entire bone because the entire bone is contaminated. And the example is here to the right. This patient had a, a diaphyseal humeral lesion, got treated with an intermediary nail. And it's likely that at the tip of the nail, atrogenic contamination. Uh, once the ball tip guide wire went in and reaming occurred up and down the humerus, uh, or even if the humerus was put in as a solid nail, disease is pushed down the humerus. So this is a patient who would have benefited from uh, whole bone radiation. This patient went on to fracture at the tip of the uh, nail and was referred to the orthopedic oncology team for further treatment. So a consideration for systemic therapy is uh, in particular breast cancer. And this is important when you are taking biopsy specimens and sending tissue specimens, that consideration for endocrine therapy be given. So endocrine therapy is commonly the first line of treatment in hormone receptor positive breast cancer, estrogen, progesterone, HER2 new uh, positive. When uh, bone is taken to pathology and decalcified, uh, it eliminates the ability to evaluate for uh, estrogen receptor status. So how you biopsy, how the tissue is processed can affect patient treatment. So it's really important to consider this. And this uh, can be a test question. Uh, again, metastatic bone cancer is so common for the general orthopedist to treat that it is expected that you know it to a significant detail. Another consideration is systemic therapy for bone disease, uh, such as treating with bisphosphonates or adenosumab. So as we talk about bone biology, it's helpful to also look at the vicious cycle that creates lytic bone lesions. And it's important because there are two drugs that can be given to help this process. If we look at the vicious cycle, the tumor cells are at the bottom, or six o'clock on this uh, cycle. The tumor cells are uh, induced to produce factors that really stimulate the osteoblast to produce rake ligands. So the tumor cells produce PTHRP, TGF beta, VEGF, and other factors that really get osteoblasts to overproduce rake ligand. Now, normally the osteoblasts sort of control this by producing osteoprotegrin. And I, I put these factors in here so you can see them in case they end up as their own decoy on your examination. So the tumor cells rev up the osteoblast to produce rake ligand. And that's important because the rank ligand uh, not only has a, a specific uh, block, which is a human monoclonal uh, inhibitor, which is denosumab, but uh, when the rank ligand is, is also revved up, it uh, gets the osteoclast uh, overproducing. And um, bisphosphonates can also help in this vicious cycle because they induce aptosis of the osteoclast. So this not only stops the osteoclast from inducing lysis, but it also uh, puts a bridge into the vicious cycle because the osteoclasts don't 
create as much bone resorption and therefore don't create as much uh, local factor on the tumor cells to create the factors that uh, induce increased rank ligand in the osteoblasts. Now currently one or the other drug is used. Most commonly bisphosphonates are used, but uh, more and more commonly we're seeing denosumab, uh, which has the trade name of Exgeva or Prolia. Uh, being used in this scenario. Bisphosphonates, as we know, have a, a problem with inducing long-term uh, use in fractures, and it is hoped that uh, denosumab uh, eliminates this uh, uh, problem. So we're now seeing patients use denosumab more uh, for the uh, inhibition of lytic bone lesions from metastatic disease. But I put these on here and show you this vicious cycle because this is a, a, an emerging test question uh, for the future. Soft tissue sarcomas. It is important to recognize a patient with a lump, a bump, or a mass bigger than a golf ball and to evaluate it and treat it properly. When we talk about lesions at the hand or the wrist, lesions that are bigger than uh, a centimeter and a half are really important to properly evaluate. The lesion here on the left is a large posterior uh, thigh mass. It is uh, similar to, but not uh, the exact same as muscle on imaging. It uh, enhances on T2 imaging, which is a characteristic finding for soft tissue sarcoma. The lesion on the right is quite similar. You can see this lesion is infiltrating uh, below the retinaculum on the lateral aspect of the knee and filling the uh, soft tissue space lateral to it. Soft tissue sarcomas appear the same on imaging. They are dark on T1, bright on T2 imaging, and not consistent with fat. One caveat is that high-grade liposarcomas may appear the same as uh, soft tissue sarcomas on imaging, while lipomas and atypical lipomas or uh, super low-grade liposarcomas will follow fat on imaging. It's important because lipomas and atypical lipomas and super low-grade liposarcomas do not require biopsy. They require full excision. And here's an example of why this is uh, important to note. The star is on the subcutaneous fat, and a fatty lesion that is low-grade in nature should follow fat on every single sequencing image. So the lesion on the left is a T1-weighted image. The lesion on the right is a T2 fat saturation image. And if you follow the fatty lesion seen by the yellow arrow, it follows and suppresses exactly with fat on every image. If you note on the right, the subcutaneous fat suppresses, so does the lesion. Now here in contrast is a dedifferentiated de uh, liposarcoma. And you can see uh, on this lesion, the yellow arrow is on the dedifferentiated portion. There's a larger lobular non-dedifferentiated portion, which does, uh, does follow fat. When we follow the yellow arrow uh, from left to right, we see that the dedifferentiated liposarcoma does not suppress with fat. The well-differentiated uh, liposarcoma part does uh, uh, saturate with fat. And that's important because this entire mass is going to be removed, but this is just a very close side-by-side -side comparison to show you that not every large mass is a lipoma like many people uh, have been taught or are led to believe. So all soft tissue lesions require an appropriate evaluation before any sort of surgical resection. A lesion bigger than five centimeters or one and a half centimeters in the hands and feet needs three-dimensional imaging. Whether this is a CT scan, MRI scan, or some sort of three-dimensional imaging, an FNA or biopsy is ideal unless the intent to remove the lesion is with negative margins. Soft tissue sarcomas uh, are painless and have a very slow growth pattern. So just because a lesion is not painful and is slow growing doesn't mean it is not a soft tissue sarcoma. A common question that comes up uh, for the practitioner, whether on the exam or in practice, is what to do with the unplanned excision. Why does this happen? Because a lump or bump or a mass uh, can be easily removed and then turn out to be, whoops, a sarcoma. When an unplanned ex excision occurs, local recurrence rate is 25% or greater. 40% of uh, resection specimens at the time of re-excision have residual tumor, and 40% of primary resection specimens have inadequate margins. So the treatment for this is uh, some sort of wide re-excision with or without radiation therapy 
and that may involve flap coverage. Now, the important thing is that when you provide an unplanned excision to a patient, you cannot observe the area. The area has to undergo a resection to negative margin and radiation, and this may, as in uh, seen here, require a large flap for coverage. This patient had a radial forearm flap to cover the defect. Now, ideally, this patient could have had a primary uh, surgery to negative margins and not had to undergo such a large functional deficit. The big things to remember for soft tissue sarcomas are size, grade, depth, uh, size greater than five centimeters, high grade, and uh, deep fascial location closer to the heart pretends a worse prognosis. We stage these patients with a CT scan of the chest because soft tissue sarcomas have a hematogenous route of spread and not uh, by the lymph node system or other as carcinomas do. Synovial sarcoma is the most commonly tested soft tissue sarcoma because it has characteristic findings. It has an X18 translocation and it also has the SYT SXX1 and SSX2 uh, fusion transcripts from the uh, uh, genomic uh, defect. So uh, synovial sarcoma uh, is common as a type. So in evaluating lesions, things that are bigger than a golf ball or bigger than five centimeters or one and a half centimeters at the wrist, uh, hand or foot that are deep, that are growing, that have an unusual presentation really need to be considered strongly uh, for a soft tissue sarcoma. Giant cell tumor of bone. This is a commonly tested item. It's not as commonly seen in practice. Um, it usually occurs in the skeletally mature patient. So in our chart, looking at patients less than 30 or older than 30, it's usually the older patient population. It is epiphyseal, and we uh, make a comparison with the skeletally immature patient having a chondroblastoma. The skeletally mature patient has a giant cell tumor when tumors extend to the epiphyseal region. It is a benign aggressive lesion. So there is some chronicity over time with this eccentric lesion where we do see a sharp uh, central border uh, within the intermediate canal, but we also see expansion of the bone as it the tumor pushes outside of the bone. The bone tries to contain the tumor over time, and that's where you get this expansion with this outer neocorticalization seen by that blue line. Now, the matrix is important. When you biopsy this thing, uh, radiographically it appears uh, lucent, but the lesion itself has a very characteristic appearance with giant cells that have uh, nuclei the same as the stromal cells. Giant cell tumor radiograph, uh, as, as I told you, have uh, a benign aggressive appearance. They can be lytic, eccentric, poorly defined, but usually there is some expansion and neocorticalization of the bone that exists. It's a skeletally mature patient that may or may not have an associated uh, mass or pathologic fracture. So the histology of a giant cell tumor is the clinch. The uh, histology shows multinucleated giant cells and, and the uh, nuclei in the giant cell appear the same as all the stromal cells. And oftentimes you can't even see that there are giant cells because the stromal cells uh, are so uh, confluent throughout. Now I think of this and, and it was described to me once as a chocolate chip cookie. So the multinucleated giant cells look like chocolate chip cookies. And out in the stroma, it's as if you just took chocolate chips and, and scattered them all over the place. And the chocolate chips out in the stroma look exactly the same as the chocolate chips in the nuclei of the multinucleated giant cells. And that's, that's characteristic. Now, many, many uh, tumors may have giant cells associated with them, these giant uh, multinucleated osteoclasts. But uh, the fact that the stromal nuclei look the same is what's characteristic to a giant cell tumor. When you look at this up close and on every histology image you see this, you see one big giant cell tumor here in the center and then all the stromal cells look the same uh, and seem to have the same nuclei. And it's actually those little stromal cells that uh, tell the big giant cells what to do. I say that the little stromal cells are the little pimps that tell the uh, big giant cells what to do. The treatment for a giant cell tumor is aggressive intralesional resection. So when we talked about uh, types of uh, surgical resection, intralesional resection and curatage is key for a giant cell tumor. Rarely do you have to do anything more than that. It's less important that people sort of get hung up on this on the test as to whether you bone graft, use uh, cement or plate and screws. The key is that the tumor be removed. It doesn't matter how you reconstruct it. What is important is how you resect it. And the local recurrence can range from 30 to 30 percent or greater. So care must be given and skill must be given and experience in removing and taking care of a giant cell tumor. 
Although giant cell tumor of bone is considered benign aggressive, 5% or less can metastasize to lung. It's important to know that because the treatment is multi-agent chemotherapy. It's unusual, but it can occur. So as you follow a patient with a giant cell tumor, you need to follow them with a chest x-ray. Aneurysmal bone cyst. An aneurysmal bone cyst is going to be contrasted to a simple or unicameral bone cyst, and they uh, indeed are very different. Uh, an aneurysmal bone cyst occurs in a patient younger than 30. They have a very cystic, uh, aggressive appearance. The aneurysmal uh, term is given because they often are eccentric and expand the bone, but they can also arise as a collision lesion arising in a pre-existing giant cell tumor, chondroblastoma, chondromyxoid fibroma, fibrous dysplasia, many, many lesions, and that's one important thing uh, to de define an aneurysmal bone cyst. Typically, the patients are skeletally immature, and uh, they may have a well-defined border on one side of the bone, but then that expansile aneurysmal component on the other. Their typically location uh, is metaphyseal. It is a slowly expansile tumor. So we do see that as the tumor pushes on the bone, the bone tries to respond. That's where that aneurysmal uh, part comes to. The bone expands but maintains the inner cortex. And when you uh, talk about the matrix of this lesion, the matrix is often fluid. So tumor bone, bone tumor interaction is that of chronicity, expansion, and slow growth. There are a lot of inner uh, small uh, bone channels within these. Um, that wall off small areas as the lesion tries to grow. The MRI shows the multiple uh, fluid fluid spaces that show up as fluid fluid levels and this is from the subtle hemosiderin that creates a line uh, within the uh, small little channels. Now again this can be seen in multiple lesions especially telangiectatic osteosarcoma so just because you see multiple fluid fluid lines doesn't mean that it is uh, always an aneurysmal bone cyst. Here's an example of a, uh, a small fluid channel and fluid fluid level. The pathology of these small channels is what you see on the, on the histology. Blood-filled spaces with giant cells uh, intermixed. The uh, channels are small areas of reactive woven healing bone with fibrous septae. And the treatment for an aneurysmal bone cyst is aggressive open curatage and bone grafting. Now, an aneurysmal bone cyst is in quite contrast to a simple bone cyst. The age is the same. But the uh, lesion is one large lesion with a simple or unicameral bone cyst. It usually occurs in the metaphysis and presents with pain or a, a pathologic fracture. One of the characteristic findings for a simple bone cyst is a uh, fallen leaf sign. So when the, the lesion fractures, one of the small uh, pieces of cortex will fall in and looks like a leaf that is falling in the uh, fall breeze. It's thought to be a, a potential physial disturbance with uh, hydrostatic pressure creating one large sort of cystic uh, lesion. An important finding is that the width of the bone is no greater than the width of the physis, and that's in contrast to an aneurysmal bone cyst where it pushes out to be broader. Uh, terminology, an active uh, cyst abuts the physis, a latent cyst has normal intervening bone, and the consideration for that is that an active cyst that is against the physis may uh, need to be treated more aggressively because there is a greater potential for growth. When the intervening bone occurs and the cyst moves further away from the physis, they uh, seem to become more quiescent and, uh, depending on presentation, may not require surgery. So a simple bone cyst shows one large fluid-filled cavity. It's dark on T1, bright on T2 imaging will follow the fluid in the joint. It may have one large uh, area of fluid, fluid level, but it doesn't have all the small little uh, channels and honeycomb uh, areas that the uh, aneurysmal bone cyst does. A simple bone cyst has one large channel, one uh, cystic lining as seen here. Uh, you don't see multiple uh, fiber septae and multiple bone channels like you do in a, an aneurysmal bone cyst. And another big uh, divergence here is that a simple bone cyst can be observed. You can treat it with aspiration injection. And if there's a, uh, a continued problem, then you can consider curetting uh, the lesions. This is in high contrast to an aneurysmal bone cyst, which typically has to undergo treatment. It cannot undergo aspiration injection because it has multiple small little channels as opposed to one big channel. And here's where this uh, uh, is uh, compared side by side. An aneurysmal bone cyst can occur with other lesions. A unicameral bone cyst does not. An aneurysmal bone cyst has multiple small channels and multiple small fluid fluid levels, no fallen leaf sign. And in contrast, a unicameral or, or simple bone cyst does. 
Yet aneurysmal bosis is eccentric, and a key finding is that the width of the tumor is greater than the width of the physis, and that's the opposite with a simple bone cyst. The width of the tumor is not greater than the width of the physis, and all of that uh, is important, and it's important to make the distinction. You say, well, a bone cyst is a bone cyst. They're not. An aneurysmal bone cyst has to have open treatment. All those little channels and the fact that it can occur with other lesions means that it has to be treated aggressively. A simple bone cyst can be observed, can undergo aspiration injection because it's one large big channel. So if there's a path fracture, you let the fracture heal, you aspirate it, inject. Um, and it can be observed and be treated uh, much more uh, mild. Here's a picture showing you that difference. An aneurysmal bone cyst, uh, when we look at the actual physis and we look at the lesion, you can see the lesion itself is much wider than the physis, and that's in contrast with a simple bone cyst where it is the same uh, width or um, larger than the actual lesion. Well, tumors by location, this is a great way to look at tumors. This is just a different way to look at tumors, um, and it is by location. Location is everything. But when a patient presents to you in clinic, uh, they present uh, with a, a symptom, a finding, and then an x-ray. And sometimes it can help you by knowing the location of a tumor to help narrow down the differential. And these are specific uh, locations of a particular bone, like epiphysis, metaphysis, diaphysis, or a particular type of bone, like a flat bone, spine, sacrum, or the actual surface of the bone. Epiphyseal lesions we think of characteristically chondroblastoma in a skeletally immature patient, giant cell tumor in a skeletally mature patient, and the uh, oddball that we don't see that commonly is a clear cell chondrosarcoma of the femoral head. Very common location, epiphyseal femoral head. That usually occurs in a skeletally mature uh, patient greater than 30. Metaphyseal lesions, osteosarcomas, chondrosarcomas, and mets are common uh, to occur in the metaphysis. And diaphyseal, we'd like to remember this by A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Adamatinoma commonly occurs in the tibia. It's a cortically based uh, lesion initially uh, that uh, uh, will bow the tibia over time. Eosinophilic granuloma or histiocytosis is a punched out lesion of the diaphysis. Infection, of course, can occur anywhere, uh, and so its consideration is given and it's added to this mnemonic. Osteoidosteoma and osteoblastoma is an eccentric uh, lesion. Osteoidosteoma is less than 2 centimeters, osteoblastoma greater than 2 centimeters. Ewing sarcoma, uh, diaphyseal lesion, very commonly, as we talked about, it can also be in the flat bones of the spine and scapula, but it is a diaphyseal bone lesion, or that onion skinning or Codman's triangle, and uh, a relatively uh, small amount of bone destruction in contrast to the massive soft tissue mass seen on three-dimensional imaging. And then fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous dysplasia is the ground glass appearance of bone where it looks like the bone has been smeared or smudged. Uh, it is a, a GNAS protein mutation and can occur in one location, monostotic or polyostotic. When we're talking about location in the spine, anterior elements or the anterior column, uh, giant cell tumor and metastases are more common here. In the posterior elements, osteoidosteoma and osteoblastoma or aneurysmal bone cysts, or these may occur uh, combined as we've talked about. Uh, An osteoblastoma is seen in the image on the right here, a very large expansile lesion greater than 2 centimeters in the posterior elements. Sacrum, ABCGCT, again often combined, chordoma and mets are common in this location. But the difference in ABCGCT and mets uh, are that they are eccentric as seen here. Giant cell tumor versus uh, metastatic disease is, is determined by histology, and I've told you that giant cells with uh, nuclei that are the same as the stromal cells are very characteristic for giant cell tumor, may or may not have aneurysmal uh, type features of an aneurysmal bone cyst. Metastatic disease is also eccentric, and radiation treatment for this is standard. Uh, if you have a nerve deficit involved, decompression is absolutely necessary. Flat bones, skull, sternum, rib, uh, scapula, and pelvis, and the common things that like to occur here hemangioma, fibrous dysplasia, chondrosarcoma, Paget's disease, Ewing sarcoma, and metastatic disease. Biopsy principles. Uh, this is important. It is the most important part of staging a patient. It should be done after everything is complete. Local staging, systemic staging, and it's so important to remember that a biopsy, although it's a small incision, 
uh, or, a, or a core biopsy, it can really change a patient's outcome and preclude limb salvage. So you should uh, talk to your radiologist, you should talk to an MSK oncologist, uh, you should talk to someone before you just embark on a biopsy without uh, um, knowing what you may be dealing with or what surgery may occur in the future. So the principle and rationale, longitudinal incisions in line with a future resection because it's extensile and the biopsy tract can be removed. Uh, avoiding critical structures is important and although intuitive, it doesn't always occur. And the important thing is that when you go back to re-excise your biopsy and tract is potentially contaminated, you don't want to have to remove important structures. When you're dealing with a bone, you like to biopsy the soft tissue component if possible. The bone is weakened when the cortex is disrupted and a hole even the size of five millimeters can predispose a patient to a pathologic fracture. So we'd like to avoid this and certainly maintaining strict hemostasis is critical. You don't want to have tumor spread outside the biopsy tract uh, and have iatrogenic tumor spread if you can avoid it. Um, we consider types of biopsy, incisional biopsy, if you're unsure the diagnosis and the lesion is greater than three centimeters or 1.5 centimeters of the hand and foot. An incisional biopsy is a small incision uh, in line with a future resection to take out an, an appropriate amount of tissue. It's ideal to do a frozen section evaluation to ensure that you have appropriate tissue. And that's in contrast with an excisional biopsy where the lesion is less than three centimeters or one and a half centimeters in the hand and foot. And the size of the biopsy is about the same as the size of a resection incision. What, what's important to consider here is that an excisional biopsy means that the entire lesion will be removed. You can't shell out the tumor or have a portion of the tumor removed and have a positive margin on final evaluation. An excisional biopsy means the entire mass will be removed to negative margins. And here's an example of a horribly placed biopsy, a patient who had a biopsy through the nerve, artery, and vein. And unfortunately, in re-excising this, the patient would have had to have a massive vascular reconstruction and uh, the patient underwent a hindquarter amputation. This is the patient who could have had a appropriately paced place the CT biopsy and maintain the limb. So mnemonics to remember your blue cell tumors, MELT, ESARC, and AEIOU. Uh, blue cell tumors, you want to learn them, L-E-R-N-M, lymphoma, Ewing's, rhabdo, neuroblastoma, and myeloma. Now this is more helpful for test taking purposes and looking at pathology than it is a patient who presents to you in clinic. They're not going to walk in and say, hi, I have a blue cell tumor, diagnose me. One really helpful thing is age. So if you see a blue cell tumor and you, you have a patient who's over 30 or under 30, this is a, a strict uh, demarcation line. A patient greater than 30 is more likely to have lymphoma or myeloma. A patient less than 30 is going to have a Ewing's to rhabdomyosarcoma or a neuroblastoma. Now once you've narrowed that down, uh, myeloma is going to have a serum or urine protein electrophoresis spike or both. And lymphoma is going to have some common uh, and uh, immunohistochemical markers like CD45, LCA, uh, etc. When you're differentiating patients less than 30, uh, they have a, each and own their specific factor. Lymphoma uh, is characteristic to have a small amount of bone destruction and a huge soft tissue mass, just like a Ewing sarcoma. And the bottom left shows you that CD45 uh, uh, immunohistochemical stain positive for lymphoma. Myeloma, again, has your monoclonal immunoreactivity, a monoclonal spike on serum or urine protein electrophoresis. IgG or IgA are common. And again, your age here is uh, very important. MELT, mnemonic for vertebra plana. Uh, metastasis in multiple myeloma, eosinophilic granuloma, also known as cystocytosis X, lymphoma leukemia, trauma tuberculosis. Common things where you see vertebra plana as uh, shown by the image on the left. ESARC or SCARE, S-C-A-R-E. Uh, these are the soft tissue sarcomas with lymph node metastasis. Now remember, soft tissue sarcoma most commonly metastasizes to the lungs and has a hematogenous spread, but these are the oddballs that can have lymph node metastases. Epithelioid, synovial, angiosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and clear cell sarcoma. Hope you enjoyed this uh, orthopedic oncology review. Thank you.